Let's look at the integumentary system at some other structures like different glands. Now, sebaceous glands we briefly saw in one of the previous videos. These are the oil-producing glands. And remember, there's specifically a type of gland, gland called a holocrine, which is where the cell, the entire cell and its contents fall away with the oily material inside of it. Then a new cell comes up behind it and replaces it. That was discussed in a previous video, too. So these are the oily secretions put primarily onto the skin and hairs because if you look at what happens when the hair and the skin gets very dry well it's lost easier the hairs brittle will break and the skin itself will come off easier too so that's definitely good for those outer layers of epithelial cells looking also at the sweat glands also called sudoriferous glands now there's two different types of these the merocrine and the apocrine now the merocrine glands are by far the most common probably 90 percent of your sweat glands are of this type right here they're a simple little cold tubular gland again they got to have a duct or a tube going to the surface of something to be an exocrine gland which they are they go right on out to the surface of the skin not onto the hair like you see with the sebaceous glands in their oils so they'll be cold up through the dermis and have that duct going all the way out through the epidermis also right onto the surface. You also see that when you release this water onto the skin to cool you off, you also notice there's a lot of sodium and chloride, good old salt as we call it. You'll see somewhere through these videos that cells don't have water pumps in their cell membrane. When they want to move water, they have to move some type of solute and sodium and chloride are very abundant solutes. So wherever those solutes are pumped by the cell, the water follows. That's why sweat is salty right there. And again, there's a very, very, very tiny amount of waste products in it, but not really enough to matter. This type of merocrine sweat gland is also very numerous in the palms of your hands and the bottom of your feet. You figure if like your hands get really dry, you can't grip and hold materials as well. So a little bit more of that water and such definitely helps them hold on to things. Then there's this apocrine type of sweat gland. Now this represents maybe 10% of the sweat glands in the body. And these here release organic compounds that themselves don't have odor, but after bacteria operate them, they do. So these glands here are more associated with a bad smell. We can also see some other glands of this system, like ceruminous glands. You find those in your ear. That's what produces cerumen, which is what we call earwax. Helps to protect those epithelial cells there, keep things out like dirt and insects, and also keeps that eardrum, the tympanic membrane, very soft and pliable. That way it'll move easily and we can hear well. There's also the mammary glands, epithelial cells here that are removing nutrients from the blood. And of course, that's exactly what milk is. Looking also at a nail right here, there's the nail body. Now the nail body, which of course is the main portion of the nail, is made up of those stratum corneum cells. Remember, that's the outer layer of that epidermis. When you look at the skin, that outer layer of the epidermis, your hairs and also your nails, those are all the same cells, all epithelial cells. So that nail body is primarily that stratum corneum. If you look at the epinichium, also called the cuticle, this is where that corneum is superficial to that nail body and the hyponychium is where the corneum is beneath the free edge and that free edge being the very end of the nail the distal part you got the matrix also called the nail bed that's where you got mitosis occurring that's where all new cells are being made pushing those outward of course that's what makes your nail grow outward and if you look at your nail roots those are much deeper that's like at the very proximal beginning of the nail far back at the beginning Looking at growth, nails grow all the time. We saw with hair, that's not true. Hairs go through growth and resting cycles, but the nails are continuously growing. About 0.5 to 1.2 millimeters a day. It's a little bit faster with the toenails. Looking at the summary of some of these functions of the integumentary system. You look at that outer layer of the epidermis, very good at protecting against abrasion. <clears throat> and again, as that outer layer of cells falls away, that's at desquamation, it takes bacteria, dirt, and things you don't want on the skin off and away with those cells as they fall away. Great barrier for keeping out microorganisms. But don't forget that epidermis also keeps a lot of things in, water being a big, big example of one of those things. Remember the melanocytes making the melanin give us protection from the ultraviolet light. Hair on our head helps to hold in heat. 
Also protects the skin on the head from light. You could get sunburn there just like you could any other place. Eyebrows channel the sweat away from your eyes laterally. So it helps to keep that out of your eyes because that obviously is irritating when sweat gets in them. The eyelashes, along with the blink reflex, help to keep things off the surface of your eye, at least the small ones. And the hairs on the nose and ears keep things out too. The nails protect the end of the finger and they're also good for protection or self-defense. <clears throat> Think about animals, that's what claws are, just enlarged nails are very strong in many cases. And again, a barrier to water, as we mentioned before, keeps a lot of that inside our body. Looking back at sensation, we got many different types of sensory receptors in this system. Those for pressure, temperature, pain, heat, hot and cold, touch, movement of the hair, many different types of receptors. Temperature regulation. Again, remember, if you get hot, you sweat, and when water evaporates, it takes heat with it. So that definitely helps to cool you off. But don't forget the change in blood flow. These blood vessels in your skin, like a radiator on a car, the more water you push through them, the more heat you'll lose. So when you get hot, blood vessels in the skin dilate. More blood coming to the surface means more heat loss. Skin first gets cold, blood vessels constrict. Less blood coming to the surface means less heat is lost. And also vitamin D production. Now remember vitamin D production starts in the skin when ultraviolet light hits it. After that, it has to make a couple of stops in the body at the liver and kidneys. But after that, it'll make its way through the blood to the small intestine where it will tell those small intestine cells to absorb calcium and phosphates. And those are two of the biggest raw materials when you talk about making bones. So also tell the kidneys to hold on to calcium, because if you were to be low on it, well, you wouldn't want more to escape in the urine. You want to hold it. So also tell the osteoclast in bone, break down bone and release it out into the blood. So everything it's doing is working to raise your blood calcium levels. And as you've heard, calcium is definitely needed for bone formation. That hard mineral part of the bone called hydroxyapatite is largely calcium. It's needed if you're going to grow properly because so much bone is needed and also for repair of bones if they're fractured. If you don't have enough calcium in your blood, it will not clot and neurons and muscle cells cannot work properly if there's not enough calcium in and around them. So we've mentioned those before and think about people in cold climates. They keep their body covered up a large part of the year. They don't get the UV exposure that many other people do. They better make sure they get vitamin D in their diet. And of course, you see that in milk. They put it in there. That way you can absorb the calcium. Many people drink milk for it. But liver, egg yolks, and of course, supplements are other places you can get it in your diet. Now, again, talk about excretion and waste. That is very, very minor, less than 1%. Kidneys and liver are going to get rid of almost all the waste of the body. And then looking at some disorders here, cyanosis we mentioned before. If you pull a very large amount of blood away from your skin, maybe somebody's blood pressure has dropped very low, the body's going to try and keep blood going to these deep organs much more than it is the skin. So a lot of blood coming out of your skin might give that cyanosis, that bluish coloration. Jaundice occurs when materials from old dead red blood cells build up in the body, skin being one of those places. So if somebody's liver has been damaged and it can't remove those pigments, you see bile pigments listed here, we'll see more specifically where they come from in red blood cells in another chapter. If that liver gets damaged, you might see jaundice. Also, if somebody's losing more reds and what the liver can clean up can occur there. If somebody's taking a lot of pharmaceutical drugs or any other material needs to be removed from the blood. That's another time in which it could happen. Acne is where bacteria get trapped deep in these sebaceous glands. The oil tends to trap them, and of course, often they grow there, causing infections. Chicken pox, measles, warts, and cold sores are all viral infections of this system. Ringworms, not actually a worm, that's a fungal infection. And decubitus ulcers, also called bed sores, are areas where blood flow is slowed and the tissue starts to die. That usually happens over bony projections, like down at the ankles, your heel, your hip, something such as that. And that's just dead, decaying tissue. Skin's a lot of it. Looking at burns, you probably heard of first, second, and third. Let's just me mention briefly what you see with each. Now, first-degree burn is a very light burn. 
you just see a little bit of redness and all you've done is damage that epidermis, that outer layer. Second degree is where you see blisters. Now you've damaged the epidermis and the dermis. And third degree are where you've destroyed those two layers. That's obviously the worst of the two. And if that happens, somebody might need skin transplanted from some other part of their body or maybe even from another animal. We'll also mention here briefly the rule of nines, which is just a way of estimating how much of a person's body surface has been damaged due to a burn. Now, the torso of your body, think everything, the trunk of your body, what your upper and lower limbs and your head and neck are connected to. It's pretty much below your neck, down to your lower limbs. That's your torso. The front of it, anterior, is about 18% of your surface area of your body. The rear posterior, another 18. All of your upper limbs is about 9. All of your lower limbs about 18. Face and neck are 9. And genitals, 1. Not a perfect system, but it's a rough estimate and works well. And then mention aging. When you talk about aging of this system and aging your skin, the loss of the collagen is a very big one. Remember that collagen is what gives a lot of the strength to the skin itself, especially when you look at that dermal layer. <clears throat> skin infections get more likely. Wrinkling will occur as you lose the elastic fibers. And as you lose the activity of the sebaceous glands, the skin and the hair will get more brittle and dry and you'll lose it a lot faster. You want to have the blood supply through it like you did before. You'll probably get cold a lot easier, maybe even lose too much at some times also. The melanocytes won't work as well, so you won't have as much of the melanin. Of course, those can also become cancerous like other cells of the body. And the sunlight is what really causes a very large amount of damage to our skin. We really need to protect it from that ultraviolet light. So look at those degrees. Here's the first, second, and the third. Notice with the first, redness and just damage to the epidermis. <clears throat> Second, you see blisters. Now you've damaged epidermis and dermis. And then third degree, you have just destroyed those two layers. Now you've lost that protective barrier and you got some trouble. 